I never shall forget the first time I heard that song. I got a call when I was a, a chaplain from the colonel to come over to his office. He wanted to see me. And the uh, commanding officer, and he said, uh, I'm breaking regulation, but said that men had been out on bivouac and said they'd been on alert, six-hour alert. That meant that whatever they did and wherever they were, they had to be ready in six hours to go for a port of embarkation to go overseas. And he said, these men have been alerted, and now the order has come, and said, I want you to get a car and take it out the country and give it to the captain and tell him not to say anything about it, but that uh, I want you to preach to the boys before they leave out. He's an old, hard-drinking church member, but he always sobered up on Sunday morning and came to chapel. And he was my friend. And uh, so I went out and I gave the orders to the captain and charged the men on bivouac. And then on alert, he uh, had somebody blow a bugle and got all the men together and he told, read the orders, told them they had time, everybody wanted to, was free to attend a religious service, as he called it. He asked me where we'd have it, and I said, well, have it out under those trees. And uh, we did. And uh, the boys were scared. I'd been scared, too. They were fixing to go over where the fighting was. And and I was to preach to them. And they sat on the grass, and I had a colored organist and a colored song leader, and the colored boy sang, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. I've always remembered that. Now tonight, if you will, turn to the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. <clears throat> the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, beginning at verse 53. God willing, in the morning at the 10 o'clock hour, I'm going to try to speak on a call to decision. And tomorrow night I'm going to bring the message on watching men die. Beginning at verse 53 of the 13th chapter of Matthew, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom? And these mighty works. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And then he has some brothers by the name of James and Joseph and Simon and Judah. And his sisters, are they not all with us? We know them. Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And he did not many mighty works there at the beginning of the text, he'd been telling about things that had been happening elsewhere and about the mighty works that he'd done. And when he told, recounted the mighty works he'd done elsewhere, why, the people were astonished. They said, this just can't be. We know him. We know his brothers by name. The sisters around him know who his mother is, know who his father is. We just can't, we can't go along impression I first heard down in this country. Somebody didn't like what a preach, couldn't go along with it. They said, this just, we just can't go along with this. The idea that this man done many white, mighty works and all of this wisdom. And uh, so in this place, they who were offended at him, Jesus did not many mighty works there. 
and the reason he didn't do many mighty works there is because of their unbelief. In Mark's gospel at chapter 6, I ask you to indulge me while we read Mark's account of this same instance, and we come against something of a problem, believing the Bible to be the Word of God and inspired. In Matthew, Matthew said that the Lord did no mighty works there because of their unbelief. When we come to Mark's account of it, it reads uh, just almost alike except one word, beginning at verse 1, And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him? that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands. Why, we know who he is. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet's not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. And Mark has the Lord say, and, and Mark says, and he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and, he, and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. That's one of the most astounding things I've ever found in the Word of God. My Lord Jesus Christ in his manhood, he was astonished, he marveled at their unbelief. What a terrible thing unbelief must be. He marveled. People say, well, it's just, just unbelievable. But the Lord marveled at their unbelief. The emphasis here in the book of Matthew is that he wouldn't do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. But Mark says that he could not there do many mighty works, and the thing that stopped him, this is almost blasphemous, but it is the God's truth, the one thing that limits, the one thing that hinders the mighty working of the Lord Jesus Christ is unbelief. I've seen God do mighty things in every other atmosphere, but he never does mighty works where there is unbelief. There is a challenge there to God's people. There is a challenge there for God's people. Oh, my soul, God help us never to sound a low note. God help us never to doubt the power and the working of God. And, brother, that's going to be a battle if you can come to that. There isn't but one message that's got any hope in it. And whether men will listen to it or not, that's the message of the gospel. This is the most pessimistic generation of people that God ever had put up. Because this world has so long heard from the pulpits the world around of the helplessness of God. And men now do not have a great sovereign God, and that word sovereign just means he's God. And so having lost faith in a God who's got control and who hadn't turned this world over to Satan or man either, but he's still at the helm. There's nothing else. If you don't believe that, why then, of course, we'll be pessimistic. The written of statesmen or, and or any of our most preachers are the bluest people on God's earth. I, I hate to get around the average preacher. He sings the blues till I get blue. 
Blues are catching, you know. Blues are catching. Worse than a common cold. Worse than a common cold. <clears throat> oh, this is a challenge to God's people. It challenges me. It challenges me. The one thing in which and by which Almighty God is hindered is unbelief. The unbelief of his believing people. Somebody wrote a book, and I read it some time ago. I forget his name. And he said, this is the generation of unbelieving believers. You know, faith is catching, too. Faith is catching, too. If I come up to you and I talk to you and you're feeling poorly and one foot in the grave and the other about there, pretty soon I feel bad. But if I talk with you and you feel good and got the world with a tail and a downhill pull, pretty soon I forget my blues and I'm all right. Faith is catching. Faith is catching. Mr. Nietzsche, you school children can spell the word, but he is the philosopher. And Germany sat at his feet and imbibed his philosophy. And two world wars grew out of the teaching of that one man, the First and Second World War. He was a mighty man with a pen and with his voice. And somebody witnessed to him about our Redeemer when he was a young man. And Mr. Nietzsche said, You Christians will have to look more redeemed before I believe in your Redeemer. You know, I read in the Bible about God, this kind of God we got. The children of Israel were encamped about the city of Jericho, and the walls were fortified, and it looked impossible. And I'll declare to you, if Almighty God didn't come to the leader, a man by the name of Joshua, and give him the silliest instructions that I've ever read about in all of my life, and he told that gang of Israelites to march around the city of Jericho and blow their horns seven times, seven days, and on the seventh day in an appointed hour they'd have blow their trumpets and the walls of Jericho would come tumbling down. And bless God, they did. They did. Bless God, it just took faith for those folks. Well, they might have said, well, my goodness, life, anybody's got sense enough to come in out of the rain, no going around marching around the walls of Jericho and blowing some trumpets, blowing some horns, that won't do any good. But it did some good because it is God's way of using the weak things of this world to confound the wisdom of the mighty. And it just took faith. There isn't anything on God's earth that I have to fight harder for and I need more than F-A-I-T-H, faith in the mighty God we supposed to believe in and preach. For unbelief is the opposite of faith. And I'm amazed, and I don't know how to handle it theologically. If you do, you can advise me after the service, and I'll be kind to you. No, you don't either. No, either. But I'll tell you one thing. I believe in a sovereign God, a God who's very God. But the scriptures are very plain that he's hindered. He's hindered. He's straightened by the unbelief of his people. But I'm not certain that this is the meaning of our scripture tonight. I do not think that the word unbelief here is the unbelief of God's people. I think it's just plain old unbelief of the people to whom he was speaking. Remember, he'd come back to his own country uh, in Nazareth and Galilee, and, and, and uh, everybody knew him. And they just said, well, nice story you're telling, but um, it, it just can't be so. Said, we know who you are. And they, they said that you couldn't be as smart as what you're talking about, and you couldn't have done these 
mighty works that you're talking about, and they were stumbled by what he had to say. And he said uh, that a prophet hath no honor save in his own country, and the cryptic statement is that he did, and Mark said he couldn't do many mighty works there. He did uh, heal a few sick people. They couldn't stop him at all uh, altogether, but they greatly hindered him. All of my life I've been preaching in that atmosphere. I've never seen God do many mighty works. I've seen God do a little bit, but it's been my lot to live in a day when men and women have ruled God out of the world he created. You see, these people stumbled because they had no room for the supernatural. They had no room for the supernatural. They, they reasoned everything out. And certainly that's the spirit of this hour in which we live now. Men are bound to have a reason for everything to see. If there come a flood, they'll say it's because something happened, and if a storm comes and blows a town down, well, uh, that's just nature. Our fathers and mothers used to think that God was in the raindrops, that God Almighty was in the sunshine, that God Almighty was in the cheerful day, and that God Almighty was in the storm. They hadn't ruled God out of his universe like this generation has, and there's no rule. Ladies and gentlemen, inside or outside of our churches now, for the supernatural movement of a holy God. And I come back to say to you now, there are just two great needs of this hour, and that's for our churches to come to the truth of God's ways with men and to learn how to pray. For if there is one need above every need now, it is not simply the proclamation of truth, but it is for God Almighty to come down and let his feet walk our streets again and intervene in this godless day that men might see the finger of God one more time. I'm not a pessimist because I believe God's never left himself without a witness, and I'm not trying to run God's business, but if there ever was a time since Jesus went back to glory when the only hope is God to intervene and come back down here and cease his silence and begin to manifest his power. This is the hour. And I believe we believe that. We learn how to pray. We learn how to pray. We learn how to pray. That's the need of this hour for God to intervene for God to intervene. Behave, believing as I do right or wrong, uh, the heart of a ministry, believing it as I do right or wrong, I expect to get up some morning, maybe in the morning, and God will do that very thing. Oh, my soul. But God manifests his power through men and women. And as we learned last night, he brings miracles to pass by the hands of his servant. And he leaves, it makes it possible. God does it, but he uses men, and he gives men the credit for it. He gave Abraham the credit by faith. Abraham did things. He gives Noah the credit for it by faith. Noah did some things, and God gave him the credit for it by faith. Moses did some things, and God gives him the credit for it. We need to do some thinking there, and it'll arouse us from our lethargy and our sometimes sinful perversion of the sovereignty of God if we'll remember afresh and again and again and again and never forget it that God has given us this treasure in earthen vessels nowhere else, and that'll challenge us. Unbelief is not ignorance. Unbelief, I believe, is the will's rejection of truth and the heart's rejection of evidence and refusal to be influenced by it. This generation, how many people am I speaking to tonight? How many of you, with every bit of the will power that you have, 
And you got a lot, brother. For although men are dead in sin, it's a spiritual death and that powerful active in rebellion. That powerful action in using every order of strength they've got to literally refuse to bow in the face of truth. And there's one thing I know that from Genesis 1-1 to the last period in Revelation, truth always demands decision. And bless your heart, truth always evokes decision. Men make some sort of decision every time they're faced with whatever kind of truth it is. You're riding along the highway and it says speed limit 50 miles an hour. And you make a decision just like that. I'll obey it or fury on it. You'll pick up a paper and you'll decide to read it or reject it. You'll make up your mind that you'll do this or you'll do that. And every time any kind of truth, you look at the television and they tell you about something and you make up your mind, next time I want something like that, I'm going to buy that brand. Or uh, you pay no attention to it, you make a decision. Let's don't get too afraid of that word decision. Under God in its place, it's a Bible word. And all truths demands decision. Every last truth, I don't care what realm it is, you are forced by the weight of the truth itself to make a decision. And unbelief is the will's rejection of the truth that he's faced with. There can be no unbelief apart from the revelation of truth as well as there can be no faith apart from from the revelation of truth. Let me repeat it. Unbelief isn't ignorance. Unbelief isn't ignorance. Unbelief is men and women with their eyes wide open rejecting what they know to be so and with their hearts rejecting to be influenced by the evidence that is on every hand. And this sort of unbelief hindered the Lord, wounded the Lord, tied his hands, if you please, and he could do no mighty works there, only he healed a few sick, laid hands on them. We've seen a little of the work of God, but living in a generation where we can explain everything by an absent God, and where we're getting along fine without him, unbelief hinders the mighty working of God. I want to call to your attention tonight, quickly as I can, four things that only a living God in Christ Jesus can do. All of our preaching, everything we do is doomed to failure unless the living God is able, can you take that, and is pleased to manifest the might of his right arm in our midst. Ladies and gentlemen, a church has got no right to call itself an assembly of called out people of the mighty Lord unless that church is mightily concerned about whether or not he is being hindered in his own people. Hindered in his own people. All authority my Lord said is given unto me every last bit of it. My ministry was ruined, I suppose. It, it ruined me. Is there ever be a popular preacher, make any money, get anywhere? Well, I was a student in the seminary at Fort Worth. I went down one day to a second-hand bookstore and browsing around, there's several reasons you can find 
precious stuff down there, and the other reason I was broke, couldn't buy a new book. And I came upon a book of sermons by old Dr. B. H. Carroll, one of the old giants of the faith, the founder of the school in which I was going then. And I bought that book, I'll never forget, I gave a dime for it, and I still got it. And I reading a sermon by that dear man of God, and just like a key that unlocks a door, I was rebelling against what my professors were teaching me. My professors in the seminary where they believed in the great doctrines of the Word of God. And what little I've ever learned about them, I was taught by those men. But at first, I, I, I rebelled against them. My professor told me that election was God's purpose in redemption. And he actually taught me that God chose people, the ones who were to be saved. He taught me that. Why, everything in me hated that. I rebelled against it. I argued till I blew in the face. I'd been pastor of a big church, and I'd baptized many, many people. I was a big shot in those days. And my goodness, to hear such damnable teaching as that from a Baptist professor, and I couldn't take it. And all of the attendant things that go along to foundation the gospel of Jesus Christ. I fought them, and, and I was miserable. And I read this one sentence from the pen of dear old Dr. Carroll in a sermon he preached in his church in Waco, and it unlocked everything and ruined my ministry. He was preaching from the fifth chapter of the Gospel of John, and his subject was the voice of authority. And he quoted that verse of Scripture, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He... The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. And one sentence the dear man said is this. I can quote it verbatim. I well know, said Mr. Carroll, that if my voice is the only one you hear in this gospel service, You'll go away from here, nothing better. But if in the providence of God you hear his voice speak to you, he has authority in his voice. And if you hear him, you shall live. That's the heart of what you folks call Calvinism. I don't ever use that word and more take three hours and a half to explain I ain't like that Calvinist, you know. But it's the heart of the gospel. It's the heart of the truth. Oh, we keep on witnessing. We keep on preaching publicly and privately, radio, gospel tracts, down on the street corner, wherever there's a child of God who surrendered to the Lordship of Christ and is under commission and has a mission to preach the gospel wherever Christians find a place. We keep on in the hope that once again we'll find out that we're not round trying to drum up votes for an absent God, but we're just messengers of a present God who does all the preaching that's ever done. He does the preaching. And that's how men are awakened to faith when actually is some humble child of God is handling God the Almighty's eternal truth. The Spirit of God works the greatest miracle of eternity. He opens a man's heart to where he actually hears the voice of the living Son of God who carries with him all of the power of his shed blood in his person. And if a fellow ever hears that voice, decisions right here. Decision will be made right there. And I don't know whether you believe it or not, but it's a solemn thing that when the powers of hell are backed off and men hear from God how terrible it is 
that men and women deliberately with all of the power of their will refuse to bow to him as he speaks. Men and women who do that ought to go to hell. And God help us, men and women who do that will go to hell. And that's the reason the Lord marveled at their unbelief. Marveled at their unbelief. There are four things that this living Christ, who alone has any authority, if you got a bit of authority on earth, it's delegated to you. If you've got a bit of power on earth, it's delegated to you. You have none in yourself. And there are four things this living Christ alone can do. He alone can give life to dead sinners. As thou hast given him authority over all flesh, John's Gospel, 17th chapter, 2nd verse, as thou hast given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as the Father has given him. And this is life eternal, that ye may know thee, the only true God and his Son, Jesus Christ. Eternal life is to know by experiencing his power, Almighty God. And ladies and gentlemen, the most solemn thing I've faced for 30 years going up down this country is that life is absolutely in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. There isn't in life anywhere else. I've had men cuss me. I've had them <coughs> storm up on the pulpit with their Bibles. I've had them have all-night prayer meetings and praying that I'd get the light as I've tried to press upon men and women this truth. Ladies and gentlemen, the only way on God's earth this old preacher knows is any hope for an eternity bound sinner is stand up on his hind legs and recognize and openly confess to this godless world that the Lord Jesus Christ is my Lord. Whether I ever get saved or not, God's appointed him to make my Lord. I know it's so, and I want you to know that I'm in his hands. I'm subject to him, that he can do with me as he pleases, that I'm dead and he's got life, and I'll never have life unless he gives it to me. Life is in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. Life is not yours if you'll, if you'll accept the proposition. Ladies and gentlemen, life will become yours if the living Christ gives it to you. Is that pessimistic? No, sir. If you believe that, you'd seek, you'd seek, you'd cry, you'd pray, you'd beg, you'd do anything to get his air and pray, oh God, if thou wilt, thou canst. And bless God, that's a good safe place for a sinner to be, pleading at the feet of the sovereign redeemer in whom is life. In John chapter 5, for as the Father raises up the dead and quickness them, even so the Son quickness whom he will. Verse 26, for as the Father himself hath life, hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Where is life? What's the gift that the Lord Jesus gives? Eternal life. What's that? That's to know God in his Son. That's to know him. I'm telling you, my friends, this isn't silliness. There's no place in here for secondhand religion. If nobody else ever makes profession of faith, it's still true that a man isn't saved unless he has received from the living Christ L-I-F-E, life. Life. There are just two men God deals with. In Adam, Adam was a living soul. And as long as you are out of Christ, you are. 
a fellow very much alive. But Christ hath been made a life-giving spirit. He's got life, and bless God, God's ordained that Christ will give life to other people. And that's the reason we go up and down this country and wear, wear our bodies out and fight the preachers and everybody else and tell you that hell is full of people who believe the fact of the death of Christ. But heaven will be full of people who have been joined by faith to the Christ who died. For there isn't any life in the death of Christ. But thank God there's life in the Christ who died. He's been made a life-giving spirit. A life-giving spirit. Nobody can give you life, my lost friend, except him. That's the reason the Word of God in the hands of the Holy Spirit does the best that God can do to strip you of all hope in yourself or anybody else and leave you with just one way to look. And that's up. That's up. That's up for this life in a look. The Lord Jesus Christ can give life, but he won't do it in the face of willful refusal to bow to truth. The surest way for you to be dead certain you'll go on to hell is to keep on sinning against what you know is so. As a second thing that the living Christ alone can do, and if you look at this outline, you'll find... It takes care of everything men need. First, men need life. And we used to talk about what a dead man needs. He needs, first of all, life. And if he's got life, bless God, he needs liberty. And there's nobody on earth that can give a man freedom, real liberty, except the Lord Jesus Christ. In the 8th chapter of John's Gospel, you're very familiar with it, but you'll turn if you wish to read it. At verse 32 of the 8th chapter of John's Gospel, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. What you talking about? Ye shall be made free. We're already free. And Jesus said, No, you're not free. He said, I say unto you, Whosoever commit his sin is a long ways from being free. He's the servant of sin. He's the slave of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son abideth forever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, there's just one way on God's earth. A man can ever have liberty and true freedom, and that is to have a change of masters. The way God's Son gives true freedom to bound slaves of sin is by putting his yoke on men, and they find rest in his service. Any doctor will tell you that if you're bone tired, the best way on God's earth to rest is not to sit down, but to do some other kind of activity. And whether that's so or not, the way the Lord God sets men loose is not by just breaking the old bands, but by putting his yoke on men. A man is free if he's free to be a man. Now, you get that. There's never been but one real man on top side of God's earth, and that's Jesus Christ. He was free absolutely free. He was free in all of his choices. 
He is free. Every bit of him had true freedom. And the way men are brought to the place of freedom is by being joined to him, being yoked up with him, being united to him. Otherwise, there's no freedom. No man's any better off if a bad habit drops off, unless a new vocation takes its place. Oh, no, man, that's not salvation. This world's full of people that to quit something and call it salvation. And they ran one demon out of the house, and seven of his kinfolks came back. And where he had one devil to put up with before he got converted, now he's got eight. An old man, T.T. Martin, used to say that a man who just thinks that being a Christian is getting rid of one demon of the flesh is eight to one sure for hell. For where he had trouble with one demon, now he's got with eight, and his last stand is worse than the first. Liberty, my friends, in freedom to do your will. Liberty is freedom to do God's will. No man is free unless he's free to do the will of God. That's true freedom. And nobody on earth can set you free except him. But if the Son shall set you free, you'll be free indeed. There's a third thing that no one can do but Jesus Christ. Men need life. He alone can give it. Men need to be free. He alone can give, it, give them freedom. And men need peace instead of misery. And he alone can give peace. He alone can give peace. In the 14th chapter of John, my peace I give unto you. My peace I leave you. Peace. Peace instead of misery. The peace of God. The peace that the Savior gives. Oh, these troubled days. And nobody can give peace except the Son of God. We can speak peace where there is no peace, but God's Son can give peace. Old Mother Merritt, seventy-some-odd years old, queen mother of a little Baptist church, after the meetings had been going on some time, she began to lift her hand when we'd ask if there were troubled souls needing help. She'd lift her hand night after night, and then finally, instead of lifting her hand when we'd stand to sing an invitation, Mother Mary came the first time and got out on her knees right here where Dan is sitting. Everybody looked up. There was a Christian in that section of the city. Mother Mary was the Christian. Somebody knelt down and tried to deal with it. She'd shake them off. After a while, long after most people had gone, she got up off her knees and went home. Next night, she did the same thing. And the next night, she did the same thing. But that time, it caused no small commotion and brought a crowd to see what was going on. And they were saying that I had disturbed her, and I'd done this, and I'd done that. I hadn't done things. I can't disturb anybody. I can't, I can't get that close to you. Only the Spirit can get inside where the turmoil is. And the pastor knelt down and said, Mother Mary, what, what's the matter with you? She said, Leave me be. Leave me be. And the next night, she got up off her knees. I think nearly everybody's gone. She came to me and said, Brother Bernard, I've been trying to serve the Lord these 46 years. And I've never had a moment of peace. Something wrong with that kind of salvation. And I said, can I be of help? She said, no. No one can help me. And then she said, except, and she pointed a finger at him. She's right there. Sunday morning came, and 
I went out to want me to do something in the Sunday school, and I went out early. The crowd was already gathering. And as I got out of my car and started toward the little church building, here came pink-cheeked, white-haired Mother Mary. And she met me, and she said, Dear Brother Bernard, she was a German, this morning, whilst I did wash the breakfast dishes, the Lord Jesus Christ, did give me peace. Did give me peace. I kind of think a fellow's foolish to reckon himself to be a child of God to whom the living Christ hadn't made real to you that your sins are gone and put peace in you. Instead of peace, I had great Bitterness, said Isaiah, Hezekiah, wasn't it? But thou hast in love for my soul delivered it. Delivered it. No one but Jesus can give you peace. Faith about him will not bring peace. But bless God, he gives peace. To be joined. He gives peace. Men need life. Nobody can give you life, my brother, except him. Men need liberty. Bound men need to be set free. Nobody sets you free except him. Miserable men need peace. Nobody can give peace but him. Men estranged from God need to find their way home to the Father's house. And I'm so glad that the Lord Jesus Christ can take an old sinner by his hand and lead him to God. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing I want to be in on this many sons to glory that's his job he earned the right to bring many sons to glory how? Well, the Lord made him perfect, a perfect Savior, suitable Savior, the exact kind of Savior, old, dead, bound, miserable, strange sinners need. He is made perfect as my Savior through suffering. And praise God. He's the one who can get men acquainted with God. I believe when a man is united to Christ, he's latched on to God, brother. He's home, if you'll pardon the saying expression. And that's the only way. I can't lead you to God. He can. Nobody else can. But thank God he can. Two, three weeks ago, it is now near two weeks, I got a great thrill. I was in Richmond, Virginia, meetings, and the dear pastor took me out on two different days, and we went over the bloodiest battlefields in the Civil War. The trenches are still there. The breastworks are there, and they preserve some of those battlefields. And I've always loved to read history, especially about the Civil War. And I read all the epitaphs and walked over it. I had a great time. During the Civil War, some private went to sleep on picket duty in the northern line. And he was caught asleep on picket duty, court-martial, sentenced to be shot. And
And later they kept on investigating the case and they found out that somebody had missed some orders and he'd been on picket duty three days and nights without any relief. And his body just couldn't take it and he'd fallen asleep. And so they began to put the machinery into circulation to recall his court-martial. But his death sentence had been signed by the officer in charge. In the meantime, this officer had been killed in action. I know it's so now, but it fixed it so there was just one man living who could countermand the orders of that court-martial. Since the man who signed this death sentence was dead, nobody on earth had authority to revoke his sentence of death except the President of the United States. And they fixed up the papers, and this man, armed with the necessary papers, journeyed to Washington. But on his way, he was seized upon by some marauders, and they stole everything on his person, papers and all, and left him half dead. And finally, he got able to travel again, and he got to the city of Washington, but he had no identification. He had no way of entree into the president's office. And there he was. He went from place to place and told his story. But nobody had any proof he is telling the truth. And you just don't walk into the president of the United States office in times of war. And he had no way of proving that he had a right to see President Lincoln. And his time was about up. <clears throat> and he'd lost all hope. He was walking off of the White House grounds, and he was crying. He was blue. He hadn't got to see the only man living that could save him from death. And he ran into a little old ten-year-old boy, walking along crying, wasn't watching, and he stumbled into a little old ten-year-old boy. And the little boy said, Mister, you're crying. He said, yes. He said, what's the matter, mister? And the man said, well, son, you wouldn't be interested. He said, well, what you crying for? Tell me about it, mister. And he told everybody else. Nobody believed him. And he told that little 10-year-old boy his story. And the little boy said, mister, you want to see the president? He said, yes, he's the only man that can save me. And the little old boy said, well, come on, I'll take you to see the president. And he did. <laughs> Little old Tad Lincoln, the playboy, the mischief maker of the White House, he took that soldier by the hand, and they walked through door after door, and they all opened when Tad Lincoln said, and pretty soon a door opened, and sitting over there was that ugly Abraham Lincoln, surrounded by men. And the little 10-year-old boy marched right through him, right up to the desk of the President of the United States, holding on to the soldier. And he said, Dad, here's a man who wants to see you. Best God. My Lord Jesus Christ earned the right when he died on the cross to present in anybody on God's earth in the very presence of Almighty God, who can be joined to him, and who will just come under to him, turn yourself over to him. Bless God, he'll take you by the hand, and he'll lead you home.